one, I'll hit start now. Hi everyone, welcome to this B Biosecurity Online Talk. My name's Rebecca and I'm the B Biosecurity Officer for Queensland. Tonight we're joined by Susie and Kerry who are helping us out with the production and we've also got some really special guests to help us out with the content and I will be introducing you to them very, very soon. So um, tonight is the last talk for a little while. We're going to have a break over January. If you missed our last talk, it was all about taking your bees or bee products into state and you can catch up with that one or any of our previous talks by going to the Biosecurity Queensland YouTube channel and just search for Bee Biosecurity and we should come up with all of those previous talks. Now we're joined tonight by a whole bunch of um, new people, hopefully uh, native beekeepers. Um, and so welcome to all of you guys as well. We've got some uh, talks coming up in the future. So next year and our first talk back will be the 2nd of February. And we're gonna be talking about apiary management for crop pollination. So this one will be um, interesting whether or not you're a commercial beekeeper who goes to big pollination events with hundreds of hives, or you just wanna get the most out of your backyard hive to pollinate your veggies. And then uh, again, we'll be back to our regular schedule, which is the first Tuesday of every month. And our next talk will be on less common bee viruses. And there'll be some interesting stuff and insights there uh, from some people overseas uh, about uh, grower mites. And then uh, in April, we'll have swarms and swarming to round off the end of the third series. I've already got the fourth series lined up and I'm pretty excited about that. So let's move on to tonight's topic. And tonight's topic is biosecurity pests and diseases of native bees. So this one, one uh, came to us out of uh, demand. We had lots of people request this one. So um, I think it's gonna be really interesting. So I wanna start off just by going through a little bit of stuff about the difference between native bees and European bees. Now native bees are just like they say, native species and they have wildlife whereas European bees are introduced species and we consider them to be livestock. And this means that our native species or native bees are covered by the Nature Conservation Act and therefore you don't need to register them if you're keeping them. European bees on the other hand, being livestock, are covered by this Biosecurity Act and they need to be registered if you're keeping them. Um, native bees, we unfortunately have a fairly limited understanding still of the pests and diseases around our native bees. And you'll find out a kind of some of those interesting things tonight, but keep in mind that we still have some big gaps there. European bees, on the other hand, we do have a pretty good understanding of the pests and diseases of these ones and how to manage them well. So a bit of difference between these two different uh, groups of bees. Now, there are some species, of course, that impact on both European and native bees, and these include the ground of the beekeeper, the small hive beetle, as well as native hive beetles, uh, ants and bee eaters, and cane toads. But there are also possibly many exotic pests we don't have yet that might, if they came to Australia, impact on both European and our native bees. Now, there are some pests that are just pests of stingless bees and not European bees, and I put them up here um, along with small hive beetles so you can see how different they are to those two species, to that species. So we've got um, a hive thyroid fly, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly, and a cyphroid fly. And these guys were hive, um, come into the hive, they lay their eggs in the hive, and the larvae are uh, a, a pest in the hive. They eat up the hive, so not very nice ones. Um, because they're coming into the hive to do their damage, there's a couple of things that you can do to minimize their impact. Making sure you've got a really well-built hive, it's very sturdy and it's well sealed, is important. And there's just, just one entrance to come in and that entrance is quite small. You can also make sure you limit the exposure of the inside of the hive. So if you're opening up the hive for any reason, keep it as short as possible so those nasty pests don't get in. There's a couple of pests that also might come at your bees while they're out and about. Um, there's bem uh, Bembix wasps, and these are predators, they catch and eat, uh, eat your bees. And there's also stingless bee brachinoid wasp, and this is a parasitoid. And what a parasitoid is, is that it lays its eggs inside the live bee, and they hatch and they develop their larvae inside the live bee. So pretty gross stuff, um, but it can be a nasty pest of our native bees. So 
at the end of tonight's talk, you might still have lots of questions about native bees and there's lots and lots to learn. Consider um, joining your local branch of your native, Australian Native Bee Association. They have meetings, newsletters and a great website. So lots of information there if you need further information. Now we're going to go across to Toby. So just give me a moment to check. Have we got uh, Toby up yet? Yes, we do. Hey, Toby. Toby's from the University of Queensland and he's going to give us a little bit of background information about um, native bees and uh, where they sit and about management. Thanks very much, Toby. Can you hear me now, Rebecca? Yes. Okay. Thanks. I am here and hopefully I'm sharing my screen. If you could just let me know if you can see my screen. That's all good. Okay, and let me go full screen here. Excellent. Okay, so I want to give us a very quick introduction to native stingless bees, uh, a little bit of background on their biology, and then I'm going to launch in to finish with an overview of our industry, our very exciting and rapidly growing industry. So to start with, let's introduce these two groups of bees, the highly eusocial bees. So they're the bees that we all talk about and they're the bees that we all think about, queens, honey, workers, but they're actually a very small component of overall global bee diversity. But these are the two groups, the apini, the honeybees, which we're all familiar with, and then the stingless bees are in this group called the melopinini, they're melopinine bees. Now these two groups, despite having so many similarities, both being highly eusocial bees, they've actually got some fundamental differences as well. And first and most striking is the way that their nests appear. So here's our friend Apis mellifera on hexagonal honeycomb. Now, these bees at, that we associate with this wax honeycomb, they store both their brood, their babies, and their food, their honey and their pollen in this comb, in the same sorts of cells. Now that's our first striking difference with stingless bees, which actually have two different structures for storing these resources and their babies. So this is looking into a typical Australian stingless bee colony in a box. So that's a, a box view. Obviously it'd be a bit different in a tree, their natural habitat. And we see these two very different uh, areas in the middle there you can see all of these small cells these are the brood cells so the baby they're about the size of a small rice bubble and there's several thousands of those inside each colony now instead of storing honey and pollen in those same sorts of cells they store their honey and pollen in these bigger uh, balls on the sides there you can see these honey and pollen pots they look like clusters of brown grapes they're about the size of a small grape and now everything here is also much darker than what it looked like in the European honeybees. That's because European honeybees make everything out of wax, that comb that is. In the stingless beehive here, it's all made out of propolis. Propolis is a mix of stingless bee wax, which they produce, and tree resins, which they go and gather. Now that has important implications for what the hive smells like and also what the honey tastes like. Because their honey pots, here's a nice honey pot that's being still constructed, have these smells and these flavors from tree resins as well as from the bees wax. Now in the middle, there's a bee in there finishing that honey pot off. When it's finished, they'll obviously fill it with honey and then they cap it, similar to honeybees. And you can see a number of capped honey pots behind there. And while that honey sits there storing in that chamber, the resins from the trees start to infuse flavor as well as chemicals. Now, tasting a stingless bee honey, for those of you who haven't, you get this diversity of flavours, and those flavours come from both the nectar that they chose to forage on, the tree species, different tree species nectars have different flavours, and the resin species flavour as well. So you get this mouthful of flavours, sometimes you get a feeling, this feel as it goes down your throat, there's a diversity of stingless bee honeys. So those are the fundamental differences. Now, of course, the similarities, well, they've both got a single egg laying queen, she is the mum of everyone. She's got her daughters who work for her and they do this cooperative breeding as highly used social bees do. Now, the thing about stingless bees though, is they are much more diverse than European, well, than the honeybees. There's about 10 species of apis bees around the world, but there's about 600 species of melopinine bees, the stingless bees, but they're confined to tropical and subtropical places only. And you can see here that red spot in the top of South America, that's the back of the Amazon. There is, there's a hectare of rainforest that was once studied there that has over 100 stingless bee species there. You can see good diversity elsewhere in the world. And then poor old us 
of the scale of stingless bee diversity in the world, Australia is at the bottom end. But that's OK, because we've got some pretty exciting species. And just to give you a little taste of the diversity that's out there, here are some particularly charismatic ones from around the world. You can see Apis mellifera in the middle there for some context of size. But Melipona, that one in the top left there, it's bigger than a honeybee. And below it, Lura trigona, and this species here in the picture is not the smallest stingless bee species in the world either. That's about two and a half millimetres long there. Look at that size difference and the colour difference. Now, the bottom three are from Australia. Here in Australia, we've got two groups of stingless bees. We've got the tetragonula bees and we've got the Ostroplebia bees. And you can see that they've got slightly different ranges there. Tetragonula, they've got six species that we have described that have got names, Ostroplebia five. Although I will just give a little spoiler that that's not all the species we've got. At the University of Queensland, uh, my colleague James Harewood's still finding new species using modern genetic techniques, but that's what we know for now. And if you live within this range of these bees, you can keep them in boxes and become part of melipona culture. So apiculture keeping apis bees, melipona culture keeping meloponine bees. Now we've got this blossoming industry that's been going for, for decades now, slowly building to where it is, but right now it's booming. It's growing every year. And most of that is driven by people wanting to keep these bees as pets in their backyard. In a box like you see on the left there, they're, they're nice to look at, the bees don't sting, they come and go, they do their thing. And so most of the people who produce these bees commercially produce them to sell to people as pets like this. But increasingly we're starting to see growers of certain crops, including macadamia that you see on the right there, buying these hives, maintaining them on their crops and propagating themselves for pollination services, managed pollination services. Now, macadamia is the main crop that these are used in, but blueberry is slowly growing as well. We know that these bees do a good job of pollinating blueberry. Avocado, raspberry, strawberry as well. Then the other three that we've got here, we think they do a good job. Farmers, growers of these bees think that they're doing a good pollination job, but we don't yet have the data to really be sure of that. But that's being worked on now, so I suspect that we'll see all of these crops being known to be pollinated well by stingless bees. So that's the second part of the industry after hive sales. The last part of the industry, and you're probably thinking, why hasn't he talked about honey yet? They're honey bees. It's a very tiny component of today's industry. Most people don't sell honey. They raise these bees to produce the bees to sell instead. But I think this will grow in the future. The industry predicts this it will grow in the future. And there's two striking things about this honey. One is the antimicrobial qualities that we see in the honey, and part of that, remember, comes from those tree resins infusing chemicals, antimicrobial ke chemicals, into the honey. So you get honeys of a level something like Manuka honey or better in the studies that have been done. The other thing that, that's exciting, and this is just work from this year from the University of Queensland, is the sugar ratios. We've got these different types of sugar, sucrose, glucose, fructose. We've also got a sugar called trehellulose. Now, trehellulose is the main sugar that's in stingless bee honeys. And trehellulose is a low GI sugar, which doesn't rot your teeth. It's amazing stuff. This We're only just finding this stuff out now. How and why and all that, that stay tuned. That will be that coming soon. But the honey industry is something that will grow into the future. And I look forward to seeing what that day will be like. And I am done. Thank you. I hope you could hear me fine. And I look forward to the next talks. Thanks so much, Toby. That was fantastic. Really interesting. I am very excited to hear about a honey that I can eat as much as I like and still <laughs> not have to go to the dentist. That would be fantastic. A spoonful before bed. <laughs> We're going to um, leave questions right to the end, but if you've got questions for Toby, please ask them in the Q&A at the very end. Um, now we're going to move on to uh, now to talk to uh, Laurie, Laurie Locke from the uh, James Cook University and she's going to tell us about uh, pests and diseases of uh, native bees. So go ahead Laurie. Um, Hi, can you, you can hear me all right? Yep, all good. Okay, I'll just um, share my screen. And, oh. Can you see that? All right. Yep, yeah, that's great. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And um, thanks, Toby. That was a great introduction to stingless bees. Uh, so as Rebecca mentioned, 
Um, we don't know a lot about the parasites um, that occur in native Australian stingless bees, or really a lot about what's known um, parasites and other stingless bees in the world. Um, we do know that there are a whole bunch of diseases and parasites of honeybees. Um, that's just some of them there. Um, the one I'm going to focus on, uh, or you'll hear me talk about, is this Nacima serrane, which is um, a kind of fungus um, that a lot of bee beekeepers would be familiar with. Uh, Nacima serrane is a gut parasite, and uh, it was um, originally, we think it came from the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, and was present in European honeybees long before it was detected. Um, European honeybees have their own Nosema species, Nosema apis, and um, that can cause dysentery. Um, and it was only, well, and, and that Nosema apis is known to have uh, some very strong seasonal effects. And it was only when um, somebody noticed that the Nosema stopped decreasing in the spring that they took a closer look and realized that it was actually a different Nosema species, and it was this one. So it is now the most widespread disease of adult honeybees. Um, it's not yet present in most of Western Australia, for example, but it is present all over the rest of Australia. It was here before Asian honeybees were here, so it came in um, probably through imports of, of Apis mellifera. Um, it's all over Europe and, um, like I said, most of the rest of the world, and it has been linked to population declines. So, uh, we know that the effects on the foraging, um, and this is a gut parasite, so it does affect the um, energetics of the bee, and and because it affects the energetics, it affects foraging, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And given that we rely on bees so much for pollination services, um, that's one area I'm really interested in, in figuring out how much the um, diseases affect foraging. All right, so uh, the question we had, though, was, um, whether or not there would be spillover of Nosema serrane to uh, one of our native stingless bees, and then what would the effect of that be? And I've got a picture here of Terry Perkis. He was my honor student, and all the research that I'm about to show you on stingless bees um, was conducted as part of his honors project. So we know that um, native bees make propolis. That's what um, Tubby was just talking about, and that, that propolis has high antimicrobial properties. So it was long thought that uh, stingless bees wouldn't be very susceptible to disease, um, that the propolis would, would protect them a bit. So that was, that was part of what we wanted to look at. Um, we also wanted to find out then what was the natural pre prevalence of Nosema serrani in uh, stingless bees, and then could it be transmitted via flowers? So is it coming over here? And we used Tetragonula hawkinsii as our model species um, because it is one of the easier ones to tell apart from um, some of the other tetragonula here, and we could find several hives of it locally. So the first thing Terry did was do a study that um, where he infected some of um, bees collected from different hives and, and also collected other bees and didn't infect those, just gave them a sugar syrup and kept those in an incubator, and then just kept track of um, how long they survived. And what we're seeing here is the survival curves from those two populations. So that the, the um, non-inoculated bees survived in the incubator about 26 days before they all died. Um, but then all of the bees that had been inoculated were dead um, within 10 days. So they died about three times as fast as the um, non-inoculated bees. And then what we did was look for a difference in death with um, the number of spores that the bees had. So Nosema serrane is a spore producing um, gut parasite. And uh, again, we've, here we've got the um, Nosema serrane inoculated bees in blue and the non inoculated bees here in red. And this, the y axis here is the spore count. And this was the days post inoculation. So we did have some background infection in these bees that were not inoculated. Um, the ones that were uh, inoculated, everybody died. Everybody with spores died within nine days, but it really didn't have any difference how many spores they had. It's not associated with their spore load. 
So the other another question we asked was how common is this uh, gut parasite in T. Hawking's eye? So to get at this question, Terry went to hives across um, our region. So I'm up in Cairns, and Cairns is right over here. This is the tablelands. So he sampled from hives um, stretching up from Coa down to Smithfield. There's a bit of an elevational gradient here. Um, what he did was capture 15 bees from the same six hives every single month from April to August. And what we've got here is um, the number of spores in 100,000 here, and, um, and then for each of the locations. And we see that all but that Coa hive had spores present at the hive at some point over the um, six month or the five month period. Um, now it looks like there's a downward trend, and that would be something we're interested in, in following up on, whether this is seasonal. When we look at um, the prevalence of, of, well, how many bees in the hive were actually infected, um, when he first started out, you know, honor students, um, they learn as they're going. <laughs> he didn't, so he, he just group counted these. Um, and I said, no, 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 you got to do that individually. So for June, July and August, we actually have numbers of infected bees um, out of the 15. And you can see that it's quite low. So at most three out of the 15 bees collected from the, each hive um, were infected. So what this tells us is um, either transmission is really low, so, so it's not very, um, it's not very infective. Not a lot of bees are getting sick from it or um, there's a really high virulence. So um, bees get sick from it and they die right away and therefore it doesn't spread very much. And we also don't see too many infected bees. All right, the last thing um, we did was to um, test whether or not Nosema can be transmitted on flowers. And from other research in my lab, we've um, documented that there are at least 25 species of flowers in our region that are visited by both native stingless bees and Apis mellifera, and we chose one of those, Singapore daisy, which is a big weed and all over the place. Um, and what we did was to uh, infect five Apis mellifera with um, Nosema and put them in a cage with a Singapore daisy flower that had just opened. We left those in there for a couple hours and then took the flower out, put it in a different cage, um, and then we added um, five tetragonula hawking's eye to that cage uh, also for a couple hours, took those out and then put those in the incubator for eight days and then looked to see um, which ones had Nosema in them. And um, what we found was that yes, it can be transmitted on flowers. So what I'm showing you here is um, we had 15 cages and these were all the cages that had exposure to the infected um, Apis mellifera. The ones here that have yellow are, are the ones in which we found the spores on the flowers. All right, and the little blue dots here are um, showing the spore counts of the bees, the five bees that were um, exposed to those flowers. So you can see that in every case where we've got uh, flowers that had um, spores on them, we had uh, tetragonula that was also infected. So, and the only place they could have gotten that um, was from, uh, I shouldn't say that. They, uh, we tested then whether or not they came from the flower itself, because what we also had was the um, 15 cages in which we did the same thing, uh, allowed the tetragonula to fly around, but hadn't exposed those to the infected apis, and none of those had any spores. So we had no background rate here. Um, what you can also see here is that, again, the spore load didn't predict um, how many bees were infected overall. So there's, no, or how, or how, um, uh, or the spore load of the bees themselves. All right, so just to summarize that really quickly, we did find that this gut parasite of European honeybees and Asian honeybees does decrease the longevity of tetragonula hawking's eye workers. Um, we found that the um, Nosema was common in local hives and could be transmitted on flowers. 
and that the tr transmission and the effects on longevity were not dependent on spore load. And that's pretty consistent with what we see in Apis mellifera as well. Now, that's just um, a little bit of information. Obviously, there's a whole lot more to explore with diseases and pests in um, native bees. Um, one thing I just want to touch on, um, some possible implications of that work and um, a future research direction. This was based on um, work of another honors student in my lab, um, Jade Ferguson and my colleague to Tobin Northfield. And here what we did was look at um, whether sick honeybees, so those with Nosema serrani, made different foraging choices. So um, data I'm not going to show you, uh, but I'll just describe what we did was similar experiment to Terry where some bees, Apis mellifera, were fed or you know, inoculated with spores and then um, some were fed this high quality red gum pollen and we found that that increased survival of um, the inoculated um, Apis mellifera, but not healthy Apis mellifera. So what we then asked was, well, if we know that the one kind of pollen is, is going to help them survive, do they actually choose to, to feed on that resource if they have a choice? So what Jade did was concoct this little fake floral array. So these are a little, meant to be little flower type things. And in each one of those blue cups is either a sugar syrup, or a red gum pollen or white gum pollen. And just remember that the red gum pollen is much more nutritious than the white gum pollen. And what we wanted to see then was, we just put these out in front of some hives and then um, collected bees that landed on those. And after a few hundred bees, um, Jade dissected those to see which ones had nosema. And so what I'm gonna show you here is the proportion of, of bees non-infected versus infected that chose to feed on the different resources. So just starting with sucrose first, you see that about the same proportion of um, bees chose sucrose, um, the same proportion of infected and, and non-infected bees chose sucrose, so about 45% um, to 50%. And we think that's mostly the influence of the hive. So bees forage um, obviously for the needs of the hive and not their individual needs. Um, but when we looked at what pollen they chose, we found that the infected bees were more likely to choose the higher quality pollen, the red gum pollen, um, than the white gum pollen. So about um, twice as more, much, twice as many bees chose the red gum pollen as the white gum pollen, but the non-infected bees didn't really distinguish too much there. And if anything, um, more chose the, the lower quality pollen. So infected pollen foragers are more likely to choose higher quality pollen, at least in Apis mellifera. We don't know what uh, tetragonula does. Um, one other implication of this is uh, typically thought that weeds have higher quality pollen. So if it means that um, sick bees are going to be choosing higher quality pollen, it's, it could, it's possible that they are going to um, select weeds over native vegetation. And of course, then the obvious question is, um, you know, do our native stingless bees show the same kind of behavior? So that's just a tiny bit of the research. There's obviously um, a whole lot more uh, work to be done in this area. Um, and thanks for inviting me along to talk. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And I think it's great to have some of that cutting edge science and, and some of the new things that are coming to the fore. Um, again, we'll keep those questions to the end, but I've got a couple already for you. Um, I'm going to move now um, on to talk to our final speaker tonight. Um, we're going to talk to Emily Lamberton from uh, Plant Health Australia, and she's going to talk about a new project that's looking at some of the um, the uh, possible threats um, and some of the risks from uh, invasive pests coming to Australia and infecting our native bees. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, can you see me, first of all? Uh, we can see your slides. Yep. You can see my slides, okay. Uh, all right, well, we might just roll with that. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks, Rebecca. Uh, unfortunately, I missed the start of this talk, but I'm sure that Toby uh, explained the plethora of native bee diversity that we have in Australia, much of which is unique to this region. So um, 
A major implication of having native bee fauna that is generally unique to Australia is that most of our Australian bee fauna hasn't been exposed to pests and diseases that exist in countries overseas. Um, that is obviously great, but an implication that that does have is that we largely don't know the impact that a lot of these pests and diseases could have on our native bee populations. Um, and however, watching what is happening overseas with the increased spread of invasive bee threats such as the Houdini fly and its impact on the native mason bees in North America, reinforced to us the importance of taking proactive steps towards protecting our native bee fauna from exotic threats. Um, so basically that's the basis for undertaking the project um, that I am going to speak to you about today. So. I'll give you a little bit of a background to the project that um, Plant Health Australia are working on. So uh, the project is an environmental risk mitigation plan for native bees, and it has been comm commissioned by the Environmental Biosecurity Office, which is within the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. Uh, this Environmental Biosecurity Office, it was established in 2018 in recognition that there is a need to invest more in strengthening Australia's biosecurity system with some greater effort and focus on environmental biosecurity. So from this came the first two environmental risk mitigation plans, which focused on acacia and also mangroves in the environment. Um, and the aim of these projects was basically to look at what government, industry and the community can do together to protect both Australian acacia species and also mangrove communities. So basically the same idea goes for this native bee project. Um, we've designed the project to bring awareness to exotic pest and disease threats that may impact our native bee species as well as to speak with experts, industry, government and other other stakeholders towards designing strategies can reduce that which can reduce the risk of these threats. So we're just in the early stages of our project at the moment, but as of early next year, I plan on contacting a wide variety of people, so university researchers, native bee groups, um, other industry groups and environmental stakeholders to raise a awareness of the risks that we've identified through our project, but also to ensure that the current context of the native bees in Australia is adequately considered in the development of this environmental risk mitigation plan. So there are four main activities as part of this project. And the first, which I'm currently deep in now, is basically to determine the biosecurity risks to uh, Australian native bees through a literature review. Now, because this project is looking at threats to native bees through an environmental lens, that means that our review has included all Australian native bee species. So including the, the stingless bees, but it's not limited to looking at the stingless bees. So the literature review that I'm working on, it's looked for records of pests and diseases that are affecting the bee species across Apidae, Calitidae, Helictidae and Megachylidae um, and pests and diseases of other insect groups like ants, wasps and beetles that have also been recorded to affect bees, bees overseas. Uh, so it is important that we include the the pests and diseases that affect other insects because there are a number of viruses, as um, Laurie mentioned, that that do affect species across the taxa. So this means that when we're thinking about pre preventing risks to bees entering Australia, threats to bees may not necessarily come only from an incursion of exotic bee species, but it could also come from an in introduction of an infected ant or wasp species, as an example. So unfortunately, I'm not finished compiling all the results from that literature review yet, um, so I can't give you any more specific examples, but I am keen to organise a couple of ways to share these results when they're ready. So do keep an eye out for them. I have included my email address at the end of this presentation, so you can reg register your interest for more information with me at the end. Uh, uh, yeah, so secondly, we once we've once we have our list of potential threats, 
We will engage some technical expertise from the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment to identify the potential ways that these threats could enter Australia and also the comparative risk of these threats. So that would include things like um, pests coming in on the wind through the illegal animal trade or pests hitchhiking on cargo and also through imports. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, a crucial component of all this work is native beekeepers. Knowing what your concerns are, what your practices are, how you think that biosecurity for your industry could be improved and anything else that you think we need to consider. Early next year, my team and I will be coming up to Queensland to and looking to connect with a variety of native bee stakeholders. So please do let me know if you'd like to meet and we'd be keen to organise that. Uh, and finally, at the end of our project, um, once we've co consolidated all of the results and identified the key risks to the stingless bee industry, we'll hold a workshop with industry parties. So we'll be looking to hold this workshop with the Australian Native Bee Association and we'll use it to share project results, but also to provide some targeted training around best practice to reduce the threat of the identified biosecurity risks. Uh, so we are hoping that this workshop will be face to face and it will likely be in Brisbane in November 2021. To increase, um, to assist with the knowledge sharing, we'll also develop some fact sheets for the native bee and honey bee industries, highlighting key management issues. And again, I'm interested to hear from you about what you would like more training on. So let me know. Uh, once all of this is done, the combined information that we receive from the literature review, the pathway analysis and conversations with all you, Plant Health Australia will develop an environmental risk mitigation plan for native bee species. So this plan will include recommendations that we will provide to the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment to help them identify how they can best support improved biosecurity for native bee populations including recommended activities and programs to guide their investment and that does also include um, research goals for industry. So that's why it's really important that we get to speak to as many of you uh, that keep native bees as possible uh, and also well, that research native bees. Uh, so I'd like to hear your thoughts, concerns and ideas about how industry, government and community can work together to reduce these risks. So my email address is on the screen here, elamberton at phau.com.au. So please let me know if you want to be kept in the loop about the upcoming workshop and resources and also if you'd just like to chat through and find out more information about the project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emily. And please, if you um, can't, if you can't remember her email, but you want to um, give me an email, I'm more than happy to put you in touch with Emily and, and, and send on emails uh, through to her or give you her uh, email address. Now, I'm just going to finish off tonight by just um, giving you a, a few little tips on what might be good things that beekeepers uh, can do if you're a native beekeeper to ensure you've got good biosecurity and to minimise the spread of pests and diseases. And so a couple of things you can do is to use different gloves or wash your hands really well between when you work with different native beehives or you go between a European beehive and a native beehive just to prevent that spread that you might be using moving as a beekeeper. You can also clean any tools you have really well between going between hives. If you come across a hive that's very heavily infested with pests or diseases, you probably want to go ahead and isolate that hive and destroy it. If it's just a mild infection, bees often will look after them. Native bees will often look after it itself, but if it's very heavily infested, get rid of it. It's better than uh, letting it stay there and continue to spread that pest or disease. Make sure you check your hives uh, before you move them. And if you do notice an unusual pest or disease, report it through to the Biosecurity Queensland hotline on 13 25 23. 
Now, I am going to go to questions now, but I have a sneaky extra special guest um, on the line. We've got Jenny Shanks on the line, and I'm going to ask Jenny the very first question. Jenny, I've given a couple of tips there on uh, what native beekeepers can do to keep their hives free of pests and diseases. Do you think you could add to that? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca, and hi, everyone. Um, I hope you all can hear me. The, um, Rebecca pretty much tapped into a lot of things that I was actually thinking um, myself and, and the history that I have working with stingless bees, my research background, um, but also where I sit currently with honeybees and surveillance and pests and disease control with the European honeybees. Uh, so building on with what Rebecca was saying around um, making sure things are clean and tidy, it's pretty um, a simple activity that I think is actually quite effective. Um, I know when I move between my stingless beehives, I definitely ensure that my hive tool is clean of any debris, any honey, um, any remnants of bees or, or pupae. Um, the risk of moving a brood disease, so a bacteria, a fungal disease, um, or any other type of gut parasite like Laurie had suggested uh, or mentioned, I should say, uh, is quite high um, when you move it quite frequently between your hives on a hive tool. Um, because if, if anyone is like how I move, you're very quick moving between your hives because you don't want your hive open for a long period. So um, there's a high risk that you can shift things. So keeping clean and tidy moving between is really important. Um, I think the other consideration that we need to think of if we are working with stingless beehives in particular is thinking about when we are trying to build up a hive, there's a little bit of an um, a activity where some beekeepers may move brood from a healthy hive into a hive that might be struggling to boost it up. Um, the, we need to start thinking maybe around um, practices to maybe limit that movement of brood from one colony to another um, because you can unknowingly move um, disease across your hive. Your hive that is healthy may not be showing symptoms, but you don't really know what's underlying and happening inside that brood, uh, brood disc or brood chamber. Um, you can be easily transferring viruses as well across that aren't symptomatic at the time. So um, I think we need to start thinking about how we manipulate hives, how we build upon hives, um, as well as splitting hives. So I know a lot of people, um, again, you may split a hive and put a healthy half onto a weak half um, to boost that hive up. Um, there may be practices where we may shift a, a box that has a lot of honey and pollen and we may move that to a hive to give it a bit of a food boost. Again, I think we need to start thinking about potential risks that those activities have in spreading um, bacteria, fungi and viruses between our colonies. Um, we also, you know, there's there's indications where I've even experienced where my hive might all of a sudden die. Um, and it could be through a manipulation when I've had it open, um, unknowingly have spread something across and I can't see that um, spread. I don't see the symptoms and then my hive just dies. So I think we need to think about manipulation, hive husbandry um, and building those colonies in a safe manner that we don't spread those diseases. Um, another practice that I'm not sure that happens um, anymore, but I'm I'm also I'm thinking many 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 years ago um, around feeding either Apis mellifera honey to stingless bee colonies or stingless bee honey back into stingless bee colonies as a way to feed them during winter or periods where there may not be a lot of nectar. Um, I don't believe that activity happens as frequently. Um, anymore, but we do need to think about the long term impacts of feeding hives honey, either honey that's come from European honeybees um, or feeding in packed, uh, infected honey back into a colony, again spreading that loop of pests and diseases um, through honey. Um, and also consider um, Apis mellifera has, has in some cases very different gut flora to um, stingless bees. And if you're going to be introducing um, a fermented honey from Apis mellifera into stingless bees, then you might be also spreading or uh, not 
providing a nutritional benefit to that stingless bee because they might need a different um, gut flora makeup, for instance. When we start thinking outside of stingless bees, because as um, Toby mentioned, there is a lot more um, solitary and semi-solitary bees out there in Australia, um, considerations for pests and diseases and limitation, limiting spread and diseases in those particular bee species. One of the main things I think we need to think about is movement of bees, strain native bees outside, where they're, uh, outside their natural um, area of um, establishment. So moving, if you have a, a really nice bee hotel and you live in Queensland and also you move to, to New South Wales or to Victoria, maybe it's not appropriate to move that bee hotel with you. Um, even though native bees are native to Australia, moving them outside of their region into another region, you could unknowingly be introducing a bee species into a region where it doesn't exist and either outcompete other native bees in the area or unknowingly spread diseases that you're unaware of into those populations and then cause other impacts as well. So um, understanding the pockets of populations of bees that we have in Australia and appreciating the diversity that we have and the um, uniqueness of the range of diversity we have and not unknowingly and, and not intentionally trying to impact that by moving bees where they probably shouldn't be moved to. Um, and a lot of the work that um, Emily is going to do, um, obviously I work with Emily as well at Plant Health Australia, so a lot of the work that she's going to do in that um, hopefully we'll start to understand if there are any potential regionalised impacts of pests and diseases should they become established in Australia and should that have an impact if we were to start moving bees outside of their natural ranges and introducing those beyond where they should be and spread those diseases and pests as well. Um, I think uh, where I started in the stingless bee industry about 10 years ago, um, there's been a really great shift and movement towards um, providing education awareness uh, and improving just our general practices as we are all very new to this area we're learning as we go so I think this is a really great step forward um, in ensuring that we keep our native bees healthy um, also ensure that the productivity uh, inc increases especially for those providing pollination services um, up through Queensland and New South Wales as well. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. That's given us a lot of insight into what beekeepers need to be start thinking about and, and um, how they should maybe modify some of their practices to make sure that we really safeguard our, our stingless bees and our native bees, yeah. Um, I'm gonna move on now to the questions. Um, and I'm gonna start here with one for you, Toby. And this one is, um, so do native bees have a better pollination rate than honeybees on blueberries? Oh, better, better is always a tricky, a tricky thing to say. So it depends. And I'm going to describe to you some work from the University of New England, uh, from Romina Raider's lab, um, that uh, Liam Kendall's work, uh, that looked at blueberry farms in northern New South Wales. So Coffs Harbour is a really big blueberry growing area, and then also up in far north Queensland, where there are, where there are. It's another fairly big blueberry growing area, both of which places have stingless bees. And what Liam looked at was not only the effectiveness of a single visit of one stingless bee visiting a flower versus one honeybee visiting a flower. He also looked at multiple visits to a single flower and he also looked at the abundance in the crop. So if a bee is a great pollinator, that's fantastic, but you want to make sure there's lots of them in the crop if they're going to do a good job in the first place. And interestingly, he found a contrast between North Queensland and Northern New South Wales. He found that stingless bees are effective pollinators of blueberry. And I don't remember the exact number, but multiple visits are better than a single visit, as is often the case. And that service from stingless bees in Northern New South Wales was equal to or better than honeybees. However, in North Queensland on the farms there, stingless bees were not highly attracted to the crop and he found a different result. Honeybees seemed more effective there. So, and actually he did that work with somebody else in North Queensland. So 
for blueberry, if you're in New South Wales, northern New South Wales, I'd say yes, get yourself some stingless beehives. We've got very good evidence that it works. If you're in northern Queensland, I wouldn't say don't. I'd say that it's preliminary investigation in a small number of crops. Um, we're talking about netting and other things that can uh, modify bees' behaviours and proximity to native vegetation also, also can have an impact. So stingless bees can pollinate blueberry very well. Depends on your landscape. <laughs> very interesting. So yeah, it depends on where you live, whether or not you, you go the native bee route or you might have to get just a few extra European bees in there to finish off the job. Thanks, Toby. Um, next question, I'm going to uh, pass on to you, Laurie, and this one is uh, from uh, Adam Hutchinson, and he's asking, uh, do this, oh, hold on, no, wait, um, we've got an anonymous question first. Um, how could Australia have Nosema serrana through mellifera imports if we do not import mellifera bees from areas that have Asian bees or exposed to Asian bees? Is it more likely a quarantine bee breach? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we really don't know how how long uh, how they came in. Um, it seems like every time I look at the literature, people have uh, found out that oh, well, we looked at these bees we had in the freezer from you know 30 years ago in Europe, and look, there was no Sema serrani there. So it seems like it's one of these things that have been passed around the globe for decades, and we were just unaware of it. Um, the, the first time that it was um, discovered, I talked about how they stopped seeing the seasonal trend in Osema, and that was kind of the big clue, like, hang on, this is supposed to be going away now, um, and it didn't. That was 1997, and um, it's quite likely by that time it had spread around. So um, even though we're not importing um, bees now um, at some time in the past, or at least not legally. <laughs> it, it's gotten here. It was here long before um, Apis serrana um, came in into um, Queensland. So yeah, we can't really pinpoint. It's one of these things um, that got around the world before we even detected it. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks, Laurie. Um, I've got a question here. This next one, I think um, I might throw through to you, Toby, and then I'm going to come back with the next one for you, Laurie. Um, Toby, there seems to be a general feel amongst native uh, stingless beekeepers that, um, and I don't know, I can say this right, uh, thyroid fly? Forward fly. Florid fly. Um, numbers attacks are increasing. Um, and I guess it's most likely um, multifactorial, but there, are there any theories uh, about this? Um, within the scientific community as to why it's the case. Um, is there any research going on in this area, do you know? So I know that there's research interest. Uh, so one of my colleagues at the University of Queensland is, is interested in this. What I would say, let's take it back to the beginning though, forage flies. Forage flies are a very diverse group of flies found all around the world. Um, everyone's garden probably has forage flies in it. We're talking about one specific species of forage fly, the hive forage fly, which the adult females go into the nest, they lay their eggs in there and the, the, the eggs hatch into larvae which eat through the nest contents. So they're a specialist on stingless bee nests, unlike some of the others that live in leaf litter and things like that. So the first thing I'd say is we don't know a great deal about the flies themselves. We know who they are, we know their identity, we don't know their complete life cycle. We don't know um, why they might be more abundant in one area than the other, what, what attracts them, um, stuff to do with their mating, because of course you need males and females for them to work. All that sort of stuff is an unknown. Uh, and yes, there's a little bit of interest, but these theories about them becoming more abundant, I have heard them, I talk about them a lot. I would say that they are just hypotheses at the moment, although, I'm not ruling it out. I, I myself sometimes think that I see a lot of them around, um, but we don't have data. Nobody's studied these, nobody's looked over the long term. And are they becoming more abundant? We don't know. Let's say that they are becoming more abundant. Well, you could see a correlation there then with more abundance of stingless beekeepers. And of course, we all learn, we all make mistakes. And when we have failed hives, in some circumstances, those failed hives become a breeding ground for more of forage flies. So there's, that's the conversation that's being had out there in the community. And there's, there's value to that, but I wouldn't say anything with certainty because we simply don't know. We need to start monitoring the numbers of these, these flies. 
and then we can start also studying them and, and working out if we can make specific traps for them. So pheromone traps or something like that. That's something that um, my colleague has interest in. That's my answer. <laughs> Thanks, Toby. And yeah, I guess if we don't know how many there were before, we don't know if there's more now. <laughs> um, Laurie, I'm going to throw this next question through to you. Um, and it's around um, if Nasima infected native bees display the dysentery system, uh, symptoms sorry, around the entrance of the hive that we see um, in, in European bees when they get Nasima, we get staining down the front of the hive and it's, it's pretty obvious, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, it, it's, you really can't tell if it's there um, at all. Even Nosema serrani, Nosema apis does cause that staining a lot more than Nosema serrani, but um, it can be really undetectable even in apis mellifera um, and really, really undetectable in um, tetragonula. Um, yeah, one of the really things that one of the things that makes it really difficult to study this is because you do have to kill the bees to see if they're infected. So um, we'd love to figure out a way to determine the health of the bees um, without killing them. I know in bumblebees they can sort of, um, they can get them to defecate at will, <laughs> but uh, you don't get apis to do that. Um, I guess on an aside on that is um, I did have an honor student um, follow up on some of this research and did um, some more um, work with incubated bees. And um, she could see that they, that the tetragonula um, did uh, make a sort of defecation pile in the, in, and we could swab that and detect Nosema in that. So that might be some, uh, you know, some way towards um, being able to detect it without killing the hive, but it certainly would not be obvious. Ah, yeah, it's tricky. Ones like that, when you can't see obvious symptoms, it, it makes it very difficult to do monitoring. Yeah, yep. Um, next question, I might first throw this one through to you, Jenny, and if um, you don't want to answer it, I might throw it over to Toby. Um, and this one is around what the top risks for native stingless bees are at the moment. And it comes on to the next question a little bit as well. Is, is there anything going on with Shanks brood disease? Is there any research at the moment? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think some of the top risk for native and stingless bees, I think we've kind of touched a little bit on it at the moment um, in today's um, talk. Um, and I think a lot more is going to come out of it as some more research is published. Um, I know some stuff is floating in the, the works at the moment and also some of the work that Emily's going to do um, in discussion with, I think, a lot of uh, industry. So I think it's definitely a watch watching space. Um, I think we've already highlighted a few key things regarding Shanks disease. Um, yep, so that was the my research that I did a number of years ago now, and I am aware that there is still some work in the space because we do still see it popping up here and there. Um, it's got a lot to do around um, healthy hives and nutrition, um, trying to reduce stress on the hive, which then exposes it to pests and diseases. And then obviously the shanks, um, the bacteria that causes shanks disease starts to proliferate in the hive and, and then take over. So um, I think it's still on everyone's radar. Um, it's still there in um, popping up occasionally in a number of hives. I'm still experiencing it as well. Um, definitely after last year's fires and the ongoing drought is stressing hives. Um, and so I think we need to take that into consideration as well and kind of monitor as diseases start raising and we start losing hives. Um, to, Toby, did you have any further idea, uh, thoughts on that? Um, yes, thanks. I, I, I'll, I'll add a little bit. So we, I, I guess we're here to talk about biosecurity. So we are going to talk about pests and diseases, which you've, um, Jenny's just given us a, a, a nice overview of what's going on. And, and, and as it's clear from this whole talk, we don't know a great deal about stingless bees and, and the pests and diseases. So there's a lot to learn. But what I'd also add for threats to stingless bees is Let's separate. These are a native, a, a group of native organisms that are that are from this continent, and we're keeping them in boxes. And we've got two parts to to threats to these bees. We've got threats to them in the wild, which some of these pests and diseases and and pathogens could all could also go to the wild as well as the ones we manage. But we've got other threats to them in the wild, and 
first and foremost among those is is the loss of habitat. These bees need big old trees to nest. And as we all know, as, as a human population grows and we've got our needs, we, we lose these. And again, like everything, we don't have good data on that. We have data on the loss of habitat. We don't have data on how it affects stingless bees. I would say that it, it probably does. We need to study that. Uh, something else going back to the management side of it and threats to stingless bees. One of the biggest threats that beekeepers see is summer hive care. So a nice healthy hive that's not having anything suffer, no, no obvious signs of any problems. You get a heat wave like you've just had in Sydney two days ago, a few days ago, and the hives start to die. So um, management, summer management is probably a really critical thing for our industry, not just for people in the backyards, but for, for growers, farmers as well. Thanks, Toby. That's interesting. I thought being Australian bees, surely they were tough enough to deal with our heat down here. But like the rest of us, I guess summertime is pretty tough. <laughs> Um, one more question we've got here, and I might throw this one through to you, Emily. Um, is there any possible biosecurity risk of leaving native bee con um, nest content, so propolis, wax, honey, exposed outdoors? Could rubber bees, stingless bees, resin bees, all sorts of other things potentially spread diseases and pests this way? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Rebecca. So, yeah, that, that, um, is a risk. So I basically, in my literature review, I have identified some a number of exotic viruses in particular that can be spread from honeybees to stingless bees to other insects um, and wasps, beetles, etc. So there are a number of these viruses that would be a risk of horizontal transmission between either a native a robber fly coming in and robbing the resources out of your native stingless bee hive, but also the other way around. So think about the native bees robbing out of the honey bee hives. That's another way that um, viruses and other diseases like that can potentially spread around the environment. Great, thanks Emily. And that, that's a really good um, message to end on in that many of the practices that we preach for European honeybees, you can apply them to being good biosecurity practices for your native bees. So thinking about not leaving waste out is important. Thinking about just being clean between moving between different beehives as a beekeeper and having clean tools and keeping your eye out for pests and diseases, getting rid of hives that are really heavily infested so they don't keep spreading it and letting us know if there's any pests or diseases that are new or are unusual. So I think that's about it for tonight. We've all through the questions. I want to give a huge thank you to our guests tonight. Thank you so much, Jenny, Emily, uh, Toby, Laurie. Um, really interesting stuff and I certainly learned a lot. Um, we'll be back again uh, first Tuesday in February. Over that time, if you have questions, of course, send the email through. And if you have any unusual pests or disease sightings, don't forget to call the DAF hotline. And um, hope everyone has a wonderful Christmas break.